Okay, welcome back to Winds and Pressure Part 2. By now, you should have also checked out the video in modules, which discuss that relationship between high pressure, low pressure, anticyclone, cyclones, friction layer winds, upper level winds, um, clouds, rainfall, sunny skies, adiabatic warming, adiabatic cooling. So by now, you should have a model developed in your head, very similar to what I drew out about the relationship between all those terms I just mentioned. Here's a diagram. So again, as a reminder, we've got low pressure always associated with rising air cooling adiabatically, possibly high enough to form clouds, possibly giving you rain. That air will split somewhere in the upper atmosphere or in the upper troposphere, or maybe just a few thousand feet up. It will then move as a a wind without very much friction. Some of those winds are called geostrophic winds if they move exactly parallel to the isobars um, in perfect harmony with the Coriolis force push, pushing in one direction and the pressure gradient force in the other, so they're in balance with each other. That's too much information, I admit. The air will find a way or a place to sink down. When the air sinks, we have adiabatic warming associated with that sinking air and since the air is not rising it's indeed sinking we're going to have those clear skies so that's going to create high pressure at the surface and that high pressure will allow the air to move in all directions outwards basically diverging in all directions moving across the surface bumping into stuff so we get friction layer winds again moving all the way over towards a low pressure cell where the air will rise up so the area of sinking air we call an anticyclone, the area of rising air we call a cyclone. That should be very familiar to you by now. So where in this diagram do you think we would see low pressure? Remember, we measure high pressure and low pressure for this class at the surface of the Earth. So I'll give you a second to think about that. The obvious answer would be, in this case, on the ground below that cloud. That's where the air is rising. That's cooling adiabatically. And then the water vapor condensing out as droplets of water. And there might even be some rain under here. So that's where we have low pressure. And where's the high pressure? Probably in the areas of clear sky. So we probably have air sinking somewhere over here, moving in this direction, going up, splitting, coming down, etc. Now remember, the air flowing across the surface, bumping into stuff gives it turbulent flow and slows that air down. So remember, every time you see a tree bending in the wind, the wind is bending the tree and the, tr the tree is slowing that wind down. If you go up above the surface, now we don't have as much friction, almost no friction up here, and we have what's called laminar flow, and basically the air is going as fast as it possibly can. That's gonna be important because when we later, or in a few minutes, start looking at the surface with that slower wind, we have to put that into play, and that will help explain how air moves across the surface, in what direction. So again, just like trees bending the wind, if you're riding a bicycle into the wind, that wind is slowing you down. At the same point, you're slowing the wind down. So the other force we have to talk about, besides the pressure gradient force, remember that's gonna tell air, tell air to try to move from high pressure towards low pressure. So again, pressure gradient force. Air must move from high pressure towards low pressure. However, there's a force or more, more likely or more correctly, an effect that we have to deal with too. It's called the Coriolis force or the Coriolis effect. And what that means is that anytime air is going to move across the surface of the earth, and the same goes for water or any other fluids moving across the surface of the earth, in the northern hemisphere, air and wind are going to bend to the right of the path that they were moving in. So air moving across the surface of the earth will bend to the right. And if you keep bending right, 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 you end up doing a circle in a clockwise fashion. On the other hand, in the southern hemisphere, air moving across the surface of the earth will bend to the left. Well, if you keep bending to the left, to the left, to the left, you end up doing a circle that is counterclockwise. This is all because the Earth spins or rotates once every day, 
But if you're at the equator, you're going 25,000 miles in that day. You're spinning around 25,000 miles. But if you're at the North Pole or South Pole, you're basically just spinning on your axis. You're not going anywhere. So imagine at the equator, the Earth moving 25,000 miles in one day. That's over 1,000 miles per hour compared to at the poles, zero miles per hour of spin. Well, air moving out of a fast zone like near the equator towards a slow zone like the poles is going to bend. It's going to jump ahead of the spinning Earth. So basically, we're going to see this motion due to the differential angular speed at different latitudes as the Earth rotates on its axis once every day. Now, this force is greatest at the poles and it's weakest at the equator. So we see a maximum effect of this bending if you're close to the poles, and we see a minimal effect if you're near the equator. And if you're actually at the equator, there is no Coriolis effect. On the other hand, let's look at wind speeds. If winds are going very, very fast, lots of Coriolis force or Coriolis effect. And if winds are very, very mild, very, very low Coriolis effect. And if the air is not even moving, there's no Coriolis effect. So the air has to be moving to feel this effect. Now, to learn more about that, I want you to go take a look at the video that's under modules, and it's called Coriolis Force or Coriolis Effect. Okay? So after you're done looking at that, come back and join me here. So having looked at that video, this should make a little bit more sense to you right now. In the northern hemisphere, if something is trying to move in this straight line here, this dashed line, it will get bent to the right of its path. Again, over here we have a line moving towards the left, but it will get bent to the right of its path. Southern hemisphere, trying to move in a straight line, will move to the left of its path. And again, southern hemisphere, to the left of its path. So we get left bending in the southern hemisphere, we get right bending in the northern hemisphere. What that is going to mean, or culminate with, is shown in this diagram here. Hopefully you'll be able to tell me what is going on in the center of this high pressure zone over here. So what's going on over here? Well, hopefully you'll be able to tell me that in that particular zone right there, this high area, let's see if I can highlight that, high pressure area, air is sinking. That's a high pressure area, that's an anti-cyclone. So we also have to keep in mind that we're looking here at the northern hemisphere. Northern hemisphere. What does that tell us? Yep, you're right. That tells us that in the northern hemisphere, the Coriolis force is going to bend flowing air to the right of its path. So we're going to draw a little path here. So imagine air is sinking in this high pressure zone, and it wants to move out in all directions. So anticyclones say, hey, air, you got to move from the high pressure zone towards a low pressure zone. Well, if you're in the center of a high pressure zone, everywhere that you move is going towards low pressure. So you're moving out of an anticyclone in all directions. That's the way it's trying to move. But the actual movement is quite a bit different. Remember, Coriolis force is going to take this air and it's going to bend it to the right. Take this air, bend it to the right. This to the right. So you see a pattern developing here? Air moving out of a high pressure zone in the northern hemisphere or out of a high pressure cell will tend to bend to the right of the intended path. And it creates a pattern that we can describe as outward. That's moving out. And it's bending to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right. That's a clockwise pattern that's developed, and it's a spiral pattern. 
So for the northern hemisphere, high pressure cells have a pattern of air movement. So the air sinks in the middle and moves outwards in a outward clockwise spiral. That is a pattern for northern hemisphere high pressure cells. So the air is trying to go from high to low pressure, but it gets bent to the right. So imagine some molecules made it all the way out to here in between. They're going to have a couple of different forces exerted on them. The pressure gradient force says, hey, come in towards me. But the Coriolis force is saying, no, wait a minute, you got to bend a bit to the right. Now, because we're looking at friction layer winds, again, friction layer winds, that means that the airspeed has been slowed down due to friction. In this case, the pressure gradient force is always stronger than the Coriolis force. What it's going to tend to do is see air movement that goes a little bit more towards the low pressure center. At this point, we're going to see the pressure gradient say, come on into me. And the Coriolis say, no, bend a bit to the right. And the net effect here will be to have the air move in like so. And this battle continues. And always, as you get close to the low, the pressure gradient force is going to win this battle. Now, we're still looking at air in the northern hemisphere. And what happens is we get a pattern like so. Because at surface layer, the Coriolis force is weaker than the pressure gradient force. I know my cursor is not doing the job it's supposed to do here, but you see a pattern developing. Whereas with high pressure centers, we had a outward clockwise spiral. Here we see with low pressure centers in the northern hemisphere, we have an inward counterclockwise spiral. So if you ever see a hurricane, a storm, in the northern hemisphere, it's going to have a pattern that looks like this. Inward, counterclockwise, spiral. And because this is a cyclone, this low pressure center, we actually call this type of movement cyclonic motion. So this is cyclonic convergence, inward counterclockwise spiral for the northern hemisphere, whereas we saw for a high pressure center, an anticyclone, we saw that outward clockwise spiral pattern or anticyclonic movement like so. This is gonna be very important when we look at storms and when we look at wind patterns, both local and global, which are coming up at the end of this chapter. We're going to culminate this chapter by looking at the general circulation pattern for the entire planet. We can identify some very key wind and pressure zones, such as the intertropical convergence zone, a zone of low pressure at the equator, the subtropical high pressure zone, a zone of high pressure located about 30 degrees north and also 30 degrees south. The subpolar low, a zone of low pressure located about 60 degrees north and also at 60 degrees south. And then the polar high pressure zone located at the North Pole and also at the South Pole. And in between these, we're going to find zones of global winds. So we have what's known as the southeast trade winds, the northeast trade winds. We abbreviate those northeast trades and southeast trades. The prevailing westerlies we find in the mid latitudes of the northern and southern hemisphere. And we finally have the high latitude winds in the Arctic, the polar easterlies, and in the Antarctic, we have the polar easterlies also. So this is a lot of 
wind and pressure zone names. I want you to understand these. I want you to know where they are, which direction they go, why they are there. But there are two videos I'm going to draw your attention to under modules in two sections. And I'd like to look at those and you would certainly be able to identify each of these wind zones and pressure zones and also these um, atmospheric cells. We'll talk about those in the video. For right now, that's just a, a list of names for you, but pretty soon you'll be very familiar with those. Check out that video. We'll take over from there. And by the time you do, 